Dr. Julia Schulenberg, we love her here. She's a registered nurse and a naturopathic doctor. Biowaves, electropollution, magnetic radiation, what are those things? She's going to be explaining those today. In the opening of today's show, what's a drug-resistant infection? What really goes on? Are we using the wrong pills to treat the infection? Just a question I've had in my mind for many, many years. Susie Cohen is going to be here, America's pharmacist, talking about urinary tract infections. I had someone ask me, Doug, why do you do what you do? Okay, I'll answer that toward the end of the show. And finally, virus or fungus? What is my infection and how do I know? All that and more on today's Know the Cause. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate, and you know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. Uh, folks, more and more we're seeing antibiotic-resistant disease. In 2016, I was eating lunch with my producer, John, and a doctor walked up to us and said, hey, I see you on TV, you're Doug Kaufman. We're putting on a continuing medical education course right here in your city, in Dallas, Texas, and we'd like you to speak on resistant infections. Are they fungal? You see, in medicine, for some reason, I didn't go through medical school, but when the word infection comes down the pike, everybody turns to antibiotics. Everybody gets an antibiotic, and if I were a physician, I might do that too, guessing that it's bacterial, but what if it's fungal? Okay, just go with me. What is a drug-resistant or untreatable infection? I mean, that's what this doctor asked me, and so I put together 50 slides and did this presentation to a group of doctors. 2016, my lecture was entitled Refractory Infections. Could they be fungal infections, okay? Refractory means resistant to or stubborn, so a refractory infection is one that's stubborn because it doesn't respond to antibiotics. Once again, we have the Center for Disease Control here in America teaching, it was just last week, teaching physicians and we in the lay public to think fungus. If your infection isn't getting better on the drugs the doctor prescribed, doctor and patient think fungus. Maybe they have a fungal infection and you're giving them an antibacterial. Okay, most physicians say, well, antibiotics can't hurt. Okay, we've done other shows that talk about some of the uh, negative implications of taking too many antibiotics, okay? The medical website Medscape ran the following headline on July 30th, 2021, not long ago, and it attracted me. I mean, the untreatable, drug-resistant fungus found in Texas and Washington, D.C. Uh, folks, there is a, a candida albicans, yeast. We all know about that, right? This one is called candida auris. And it is non, it has minimal response. There's a type of antifungal drugs called icocandins that it seems to be minimally responsive to. But to most of the other antifungal drugs, you hear me talk about them, Diflucan, Sporinox, Lamisil, it doesn't treat this infection. The Center for Disease Control, the report said, has reported two clusters of Candida auris. Now, auris is Latin for ear. Uh, Candida auris infections resistant to all antifungal medications in long-term care facilities. There's your first clue. People are passing this back and forth. Because these pan-resistant infections occurred without any exposure to antifungal drug, the cases were even more worrisome. These clusters are the first time such nosocomial transmissions have been detected. They were amazed since we caused antibiotic-resistant bacteria because we over-dispensed antibiotics. These doctors in this report on Medscape, good people, twice my IQ, we can't believe these people have anti, the Candida auris is a fungus that came about without us giving tons of antifungal drugs. It just came on. They're used to creating uh, medicine-resistant bacteria, right? C. diff, et cetera. Uh, too many antibiotics spoil the broth. 
they can't believe something came along, a fungal infection that isn't treatable with antifungals that it never saw. Because usually too many antifungals creates resistance, okay? Then they're calling this a nosocomial infection in English. Candida auris is classified as a single cell fungus. It's a yeast that resists being cured by antifungal drugs. These researchers were shocked because this resistance to Candida auris occurred without antifungal drugs causing the resistance. Recall that antibiotics cause antibiotic resistance, but there were no antifungal drugs used in these cases. <clears throat> if you stand up and look down, I totally understand what these researchers are saying. Where in the heck did this come from? Uh, why do they say, or what do they say cause the resistance to Candida auris? The researchers assigned the name nosocomial transmission to the outbreak. This means that the healthcare facility, in both of these cases, long-term acute care facilities, have been implicated as the cause of these outbreaks. Now, most importantly, boom, Horopito, a New Zealand pepper extract available in health food stores, may be able to treat Candida auris infection, says a laboratory test result that I was part of a few years ago. Their results stated that Horopito exhibited antifungal activities against yeast, including Candida auris and skin fungi called dermatophytes. Talk to your doctor. If you have Candida auris, know somebody who does. Talk to your doctor about finding Horopito extract. It's from New Zealand. I hope that helps. Oh, my good buddy, all of our good buddy, Dr. Julia Schulenberg is here with us right now. She's a naturopathic doctor. She's an RN with her bachelor's degree. She's got more degrees than a thermometer. Thank you for coming in today and, and being with us. I'll never forget, Dr. Julia, years ago, 11, 12 years ago, we had a home in the country. And all of a sudden, my wife started spinning and getting headaches for reasons we couldn't figure out. She started seeing doctors. Well. When we moved from that home a few years later, bought the home we're in right now, gone. We learned that behind the headboard outside, the utility company put a smart meter up out there. Now I know it doesn't affect everyone the same way, but these electromagnetic fields created by these easy you know, machines they put outside your, your home can sometimes cause uh, bio waves, brain waves, to do what happened to Ruth. I mean, do you agree? It's, do you it's, see this? It's chaos. It's it a, is. It's electro pollution. It's, pollu it's electro pollution. Yeah. You know, we have pollution of pesticides, insecticides, um, um, hydrocarbons, uh, you know, pollution uh, fumes, and all that. But this is electro pollution. So it's high frequency electromagnetic radiation coming from. Um, cell towers and power lines and satellite frequencies, radio frequencies, um, cell phones, computers, uh, all these electronics, uh, it, it, they emit very high, high frequency waveforms, so it, causes a, it can cause a chaos in our brains because our brains uh, just uh, function at very slow, slow frequencies, such as about 7 to 37 hertz, and then when we sleep, it ne should slow down to about 0.3 to 5 hertz. This is the delta uh, wave state of sleep. You've got the audience's attention right now. So many of us suffer from, you know, jumping neurological problems. We have no idea, folks, that maybe, just maybe, it's rare, but maybe that smart meter that they put by the by 12 inches from your head, from your headboard, uh, is contributing to this. What can people do to find out more about this? Well, uh, there's a website that I really like. It's called, it's Pulsed techresearch.com, P-U-L-S-E-D, techresearch.com, and they have a lot of research um, that they've done for decades on electropollution and then also some suggestions on how to mitigate or counteract the harmful effects of this electropollution on the body. So that's a very good resource. It's a research uh, website rather than a sales and marketing website. Mm. You told me one time that you had someone who suspected this in their house. And what you got to do is take a weekend, get up to the mountains, rent a little cabin far from the madding crowds, and see if you wake up headache-free or pulse-free, you know, with all this a problem so many people are having. 
and uh, that would be one way to fix it. Now, if they move back into their home and it starts again, there's something, uh, uh, some kind of a, who knows, a tower, a cell phone, something interfering with that. Is there a fix? Can I take drops well, and get normal again? Well, actually, the best fix is um, to uh, avoid as much of that as possible. So one of the easy fixes is just uh, for someone who's really electromagnetically sensitive, on internally anyway, they can work on uh, getting rid of chelating and binding the heavy metals from their system because if you have a high load of heavy metals, you become like a lightning rod to EMF. Okay, uh, so that's something you can do internally, but then externally in the home environment, a person can uh, turn off as many, some, like the Wi-Fi when they're not using it or at bedtime, they can uh, put their cell phones away from their bed um, or, and then also put it on airplane mode if they don't need, uh, need, need it uh, yeah. during the night, which most people don't. Well, but we have kids. And you yes. always, now, you for know. those people who have teenagers, then yes, you want the cell phone. <laughs> you cell want, the phone, self <laughs> you want an alarm system in your house. It's so fascinating, uh, folks, that we're now dealing where we didn't 50 years ago when I was a kid. This, you know, we had telephone poles, we had wrist watches, right? I have a friend who's a doctor who even takes his watch off at night, plugs his, uh, you know, plug in outlets in his room, uh, shuts off the Wi Fi in his house and sleeps like a baby, he contends. We're being bombarded with these electromagnetic fields. The reason I asked Dr. Julia to come in and talk about this, number one, you can set up an appointment with her and she'll talk to you more about it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But number two, so many of us are symptomatic and we have the best neurologists. We have the best gastroenterologists and they don't know a thing about this. This is not taught in medical schools. Everybody needs their own. Dr. Julia, thank you for coming in today and educating thank you. us. You thank bet. you. Two reasons for doing this five minute segment. Number one, to answer the question, is your infection uh, viral or fungal? Okay, we'll discuss that. And then to teach you a little bit about a very complex neurological condition called multiple sclerosis. Dr. Dave Holland and I almost 20 years ago published that sometimes multiple sclerosis is what we call a chronic mycotoxicosis. We'll go over that today, okay? So let's start here. Is your infection viral or fungal? Okay, this comes out of a medical website. When patients present with an infection, they often expect they will receive a drug to treat it. The problem is that viral infections shouldn't be treated with antibiotics because antibiotics only kill bacteria. Nevertheless, physicians ostensibly continue to confuse the two treatments according to an off-cited article published in Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016. Folks, that's five years ago. What are our medical schools teaching? I don't even, you know this, right? A virus doesn't respond to an antibiotic and yet so often uh, antibiotics are prescribed. Okay, next graphic. A few years later, three years later, in 2019, scientists asked, are the viral agents of multiple sclerosis, ALS, and schizophrenia buried in our genome? Apparently, 8% of our genome is of viral origin, but I'd argue that these three neurological illnesses don't even remotely involve viruses. Oh, gosh, I've done some publishing in this area, so let's take one, multiple sclerosis. We call it MS. For example, says this one, this is healthline.com. It's a good website. For example, there exist four possible causes of MS according to the reference below. Number one, your immune system. Number two, your genetics, mom or dad or grandma or grandpa. Number three, your environment. Or number four, infection. And then look what they wrote. One theory suggests that bacteria or viruses that have similar components to brain and spinal cord cells go on to trigger two immune system actions. What about fungus? What? I'll never forget, I was sitting before three or four hundred physicians. My producer, John, and I were there in Colorado, or no, it was uh, Florida, giving this lecture. And you could have heard a pin drop as I'm teaching. We're calling these retroviruses, but are they fungal mycotoxins? And so just go with me. These were a couple of the graphics that I gave to demonstrate that sometimes multiple sclerosis and other Parkinson's neurolog autism neurological diseases have a fungal etiology. Well, how did the patient get a fungus?
the ducting system in your house is spewing, if it's moldy or the roof is leaked, uh, aspergillus mold or penicillium mold, you're breathing it over extended periods of time. Antibiotics are fungal mycotoxins. Have you been on a lot of those? There are many, many ways, but here's the first one. I asked this of the doctors, and I referenced it from a 1997 Center for Disease Control graphic. <clears throat> Is multiple sclerosis a chronic mycotoxicosis? Chronic means ongoing. Mycofungus toxic poison osis disease. Is therefore MS a chronic fungal poison exposure disease? Here's what it said. MS is a loss of molecules, they're called uh, sphingolipids, from the white matter of the central nervous system. Fungal mycotoxins disrupt those fungal lipid uh, biosynthesis and one mycotoxin called gliotoxin can induce nerve cell death. It bursts it apart, apoptosis. Wow, that says, yeah, fungus can give you all the signs and symptoms of multiple sclerosis. But get this one. Scientists has re have recovered a heat-stable toxin from the cerebral spinal fluid of MS patients. This toxin called gliotoxin is present only in active cases of multiple sclerosis, and this was 25 years ago. In this particular study, they took CSF, central uh, or uh, cerebral spinal fluid, from MS patients, heat treated it to destroy bacteria or anything else that might be inducing the problems, then exposed it to the nerve cell in laboratory culture. What happened? The nerve cells died. We know that gliotoxin is a heat stable it survived the heating process, aspergillus poison. Folks, I don't purport to know all the causes of neurological damage. If you could have been on my shoulder watching the doctor's faces as I was reporting, moldy environments, antibiotics, alcohol, these things all expose us to mycotoxins. So did the MS patients live in a moldy home? or eat certain foods, corn, peanut, have alcohol problems, etc. We just don't know the answer to that, but sometimes MS is caused, we now know, by fungus. Let's talk about urinary tract infections because who here doesn't want to talk about that? It's a serious problem for many people and this affliction keeps coming back. It returns on average 25% of the time and the antibiotics prescribed to treat UTIs cause havoc by annihilating your healthy probiotics. It happens because you're killing off the bad germs in your urinary tract, but you're also killing off the good germs in your intestines. It's a dilemma. That's why I sometimes suggest cranberry juice, the undiluted and unsweetened kind, if you can handle the sour taste. Another natural approach is D-mannose, an extract from cranberry juice. There's also uva ursi, a dietary supplement, which is an herb, and you can find that at any health food store. Uva ursi is particularly effective against the bacteria that causes these infections. Now, one final thought. If your doctor has you on an antibiotic to treat or to prevent UTIs, please make sure you take a probiotic. Not only does this restore your intestinal flora, but it could prevent these infections from happening in the first place. I'm Susie Cohen, America's Pharmacist. Uh, folks, many of you know that I am a student of mycology. I study mycology. I've done PowerPoint presentations. If you've been with me for decades, you've seen them on TV that generally mycology isn't a field of interest for most doctors. Number one, it isn't taught in medical training. What? Are you kidding me? Fungi can cause cancer and other diseases and it isn't taught? I wish it were. After 50 years of working and researching in this field, after what, a dozen books I've written on the subject, after 22 consecutive years on TV, let me tell you something very general. When I'm gone, who will carry on? I do live Facebook segments every Tuesday and Thursday. You can go on the internet to knowthecause.com and find out when I'm doing them. I do those because I get questions from people that I can't get on TV. You're asking me real questions like this one. Why do I teach what I teach? I'm hoping that this very bright audience 
that like my show will one day pick up my interest in this field of mycology. It really scares me to know that oncologists haven't a clue that cancer can be provoked, can be initiated by these fungal mycotoxins. It blows me away to think that doctors have published on the fungal link to Crohn's. Not a gastroenterologist knows this. They get antibiotics, and antibiotics tend to feed uh, these, uh, uh, these fungal problems. What motivates me? Sitting over there on this shelf across our studio is a two inch thick docket, little tiny thin pages of people who have sent me testimonials in the last two years alone. I get thousands of testimonials. I could wear them on my sleeve like a hero badge, or I could just tell you how humbling it has been for me to not only have given this information from the Lord above, but to pass it along to you. That's what continues to motivate me. I'm concerned that when I'm gone, who will carry this on? Medicine doesn't want to carry this on. Why would that be? Our biggest selling drugs, billions of dollars, are called antibiotics. And you see antibiotics are fungal mycotoxins. Who would shoot that goose that's laying the golden egg? So isn't this a fascinating show? If you think you enjoy it, imagine working here in the studio where we study constantly. What is a drug-resistant infection? Could we be treating a fungal infection with an antibiotic that deserved an antifungal drug? Then toward later in the show, is it a virus or is it a fungus? Folks, science, this is science, and science is still confused about some of these things. In other shows, we. We tell you that sometimes a fungal infection mimics a bacterial infection and vice versa. Thank you, Dr. Julia Schulenberg. She is here in Dallas. We send people to her. They absolutely love her. She looks at health problems with different eyes than physicians do, and often both are very, very good to help the patient through the struggles. Urinary tract infections, and then why do I do this? Because one day I won't be here, and you'll get to carry on. God bless you folks, I'll see you next time.